Hello, and welcome to The Price is Right, How to Quote Smarter from Spot Rates to Mini Bids. In this session, we are going to focus on all things pricing for our smaller growing businesses, including spot quoting best practices, LTL versus intermodal versus LTL or versus truckload quotes, and also when it makes sense to use contract pricing compared to spot rates. Today, I'm excited to be joined by a panel of Coyote experts, as well as a Coyote customer to provide his unique point of view. But before we do introductions, want to call out a few things. First, this is a live session, so be sure to stick around at the end for our Q&A. Second, you can ask questions throughout the presentation, and we'll address as many as we can at the end. Finally, you can find pricing resources in the topic deep dive section in the event site. I'm Kate Van Dyke, SVP of Enterprise Operations, and I will be your moderator today. I'm Elizabeth Williams, Director of CTM Operations. I'm Jessica Robinson, Manager of Inbound Qualification. I am Ryan Maltby, the CEO of bdqgrills.com. All right, let's get right into it with a few definitions just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Elizabeth, do you want to walk us through some of the basics when it comes to pricing? Yeah, thanks, Kate. So there are really two ways to price a shipment. You have spot rates and then contract or primary pricing. Spot rates are a one-time fee a shipper pays to move one load at current market pricing. So spot rates are a form of short-term transactional pricing that reflect the real-time balance of supply and demand in the market. So if there is less demand, high supply of carriers, spot rates will be lower. Um, and then a market like we're in now where the demand for shipper, shipping is higher than the supply of carrier spot rates are very high. And then on the other side, you have contract or primary rates. These are more predictable. They're longer term, a little bit more stable um, for the truckload freight. At the end of the bid process, a shipper will award lanes to specific providers based on rate, service, and other considerations. Primary freight is those rates are normally locked in for 12 months. They can also be as short as a quarter or six months and sometimes as long as two years. And spot rates, again, are much shorter. A rate provided by a carrier is normally good for 24 hours. So how are those rates determined? Yes, so contract rates are determined in a bid process. A shipper or customer will go out to bid and it is best to get contract pricing when you have a predictable freight environment. Um, it can be a win-win for both carriers and shippers because carriers get fixed rates and shippers get committed, or, and shippers give committed load volume. Um, spot rationale to go out to get a one-time quote is best if your primary and backup carriers don't accept a lane at their rate, if you have an urgent or unexpected shipment, and if there's just not consistent, enough consistency on a lane to justify going out to bid and getting that contract rate. Awesome, and can you talk a little bit about fuel surcharge? Yes, so fuel surcharge is a fee added on at the time of shipping. Um, fuel is very volatile and it's very unpredictable. It wouldn't be reasonable to ask a carrier to lock in fuel pricing at the time of a bid. So fuel prices change weekly. Diesel prices are published every week and those schedules are determined at the time of the bid, whether a shipper is going to use the EIA schedule or if they have their own schedule. Um, so that's determined and then added again at the time the shipment moves. Um, another fee to budget into your transportation costs would be accessorials. Those are also added at the time of shipment. Normally after a shipment is delivered, they can be harder to predict. Um, some accessorials like team drivers or a lift gate, you know, before a shipment goes, but most of them like detention or a tow new um, lumpers, you don't know ahead of time. So a good way to think about accessorials, if you're putting them in your budget is to look at last year's accessorials. And that's a good general way to see what you're probably going to spend this year. Awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth. Now that we've covered pricing 101, let's talk about how you can get an LTL or an inter intermodal rate. Ryan, can you talk us through just the general process of getting a LTL spot quote? Yeah, so there's there's a variety of ways that you could do it uh, directly with Coyote. Um, how we typically do it is we have representatives that help uh, with our with our uh, our account. So we have several reps that we can email the information to um, regarding pickup addresses, delivery addresses, and then it's it's actually 
fairly simple. Um, they send back a list of rates from various providers, as well as the transit times for each rate. Um, you know, each rate varies in price, it varies in transit date, depending on the carrier. Um, and the cost is obviously going to affect the service. And uh, there's other ways that you could do it. They have their own platform on the back end that you can punch in all this information and, you know, select your accessorials like, um, you know, she was talking about your lift gate services, your, um, you know, other things like limited space, um, you know, and, and things of that nature. And you basically get your rates that way. So are there any details that you absolutely need to have when submitting a request for a spot quote? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, you know, pickup is, is there are many variables when it comes to pickup. Uh, you know, some, some of our vendors um, in certain cases only require pickups at certain times of certain days of the week. It's not like this 24 seven service. So you have to make sure that, you know, certain shipping carriers are understanding of that so that, you know, shipments aren't delayed or, um, you know, drivers aren't set back, which can then incur fees. Um, you know, I mean, so there's, there's ways of saving time and money there. Um, other things is, you know, ensuring that a lift gate is needed when a, when a product is delivered. Um, you know, if, if a driver shows up to the property with a grill and, you know, it doesn't have a lift gate, there's absolutely no way of getting that off the truck. It has to go back to the, to the terminal. A new truck has to be provided. I mean, there's, there's various things. So. Yeah, that would be problematic. <laughs> it would be, yes. <laughs> we try to avoid those problems. <laughs> How much lead time do you typically need? Um, well, we require about a 24 to 48 hour uh, lead time for pickup. So um, essentially when we provide the information to um, our carrier, once we decide which uh, freight company we're going to be going with, we basically inform them that the pickup needs to be made the next day um, or the day after. If that for some reason is not met, we go back to the list of carriers and we revise who is being picked up on the third day, so the 72 hour. Um, and typically it, it, most shipments are picked up within a 24 hour period. Good to know. Can I negotiate rates or how do I know that I'm getting like the best rate out there? Uh, maybe in 2019 you could, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, unfortunately, um, you know, I mean, at this moment in time, like, you know, she was saying it's, it, it's shipping is very, very expensive at this moment in time. Um, not only that, but it is, um, very difficult at this moment in time as well. And, you know, we are trying to be respectful of that to carriers as well as, you know, our representatives that are managing our account as well, you know, and there are various ways that you can negotiate rates. Um, if it makes sense, you know, you can do the long-term agreements, those, those six month, you know, short agreements and the longer one year to two year agreements, if you're looking at saving additional money. Um, but you know, at this moment in time with what we're seeing in the market, the short answer is no. <laughs> So is the cheapest rate always the best rate, do you think? Like, how do you manage that process? <laughs> uh, no, not necessarily. Um, so it's, it really takes a lot of trial and error. Um, so for our company in general, we have been in business for two years now. So this is going on our second year. Um, so overall, about 18 months in total. And we have gone through, I want to say, four freight brokers before landing on Coyote for the last year. Um, Coyote. I'm going to nod my hat to Coyote really quick. They've been absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of trial and error. Um, you know, when it comes to freight in a business, look, I mean, advertising and freight are probably the two biggest expenses for most companies. And, you know, a lot of individuals love to look at the freight bill and say, Hey, we could cut this 20% if you go with us. And what they don't often understand is that, you know, and I deal with it a lot for third party companies that are coming to us that are trying to compete with rates or invoices. You know, they're not, they're not giving the correct fees. They're not showing lift gates. They're not showing fuel surcharges. They're not showing, you know, limited pickups. They're not showing a, a lot of things. And, you know, all of those things kind of play into effect of, of the rate in general. And so to answer your question, no, um, you know, price is never the best option um, to, to kind of, base your, your service off of, um, you know, transit days come into effect, reliability, and just the understanding of being in the industry for quite some time, you know, which shipping companies are going to be the most reliable, um, when it comes to handling a 10 to $15,000 barbecue order. Um, and it's just, you know, I like to view it as the same way as staying in a hotel. You know, there's a reason the motel eight is, is 
what it is and the price that it is. And there's a reason that the risk Carlton is what it is and you know the price that it is. It's it all comes down to service. Um, and when you find that sweet spot of what carrier works best for you, it really helps um, transcend working with them and, and just figuring out a reliable solution with them. Yeah, and that's a great call out that rates might have hidden charges or exclude charges. So do they include certain accessorials or things of that nature? Probably good questions to ask up front, right? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I I mean, just from my personal experience alone, I mean, we we're a fairly large e-commerce online retailer, right? And so we get, you know, probably I want to say twice to three times a week, we get, you know, various providers outsourcing their services to us and saying, hey, you know, we can beat your rates by 20 to 30 percent. And it's like, well, I don't want you to do that. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I'm not looking for that. Right. And so and it's funny because I'll call them out sometimes and I'm like, OK, well, you know, here's an invoice. Show me what you can do. And they always come out with these like, you know, garage shipping companies that I've never heard of in my entire life. And they're not showing liftgate services. They're not showing, you know, fuel surcharges. They're not showing, you know, um, just really anything. And it's it, it, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, yeah, on paper, saving a hundred dollars per shipment looks great until you realize you're not saving a hundred dollars per shipment and in fact it's more work more money you're you're only the only person that's being affected by this at the end of the day is the customer and the consumer and that's never a good thing making their job you know harder so it reminds me of flying like spirit airlines like you're gonna <laughs> get a really yeah. cheap rate up front but then you're gonna have to pay for absolutely everything right, right. And then that soda is five dollars. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Go to the bathroom is another ten. Yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> well, thank you. Let's move on to intermodal now. Uh, Joss, can you walk us through just some of the basics when it comes to intermodal and what you can uh, determine between like intermodal rates versus LTL and truckload and when to use which one? Sure. Yeah. So um, intermodal can actually be a great mode of transportation. If you find that it fits the freight that you're shipping, like it's a good fit or even your business needs. I would say for anyone that is not familiar with the term intermodal, basically it's just shipping your, your freight over rail or um, yeah, using the train. So essentially it is kind of comparable to truckload if you're familiar with um, shipping your, your goods in that manner, except for, again, it, it's moving by rail, you know, a different mode. Um, some things to consider when, you know, looking for a spot quote or to determine if intermodal is a good fit for you um, would just be the current truckload rates that are maybe in comparison to that intermodal rate. Typically, intermodal is a good fit if you're looking for something that provides um, kind of like a cost incentive. So typically on hand, it's about a 10 to 15 percent cost savings in comparison to truckload. But that also has a um, an impact, or I should say, you would want to weigh in or take into account just um, the capacity availability, and also just the time frame and seasonality of when you're shipping those goods. I'll kind of go into that a little bit more, but it could have an impact where you know potentially truckload is a better fit over over the rail. Um, one other thing to consider would be the lane that you're shipping. So. Primarily, intermodal is a good fit for anything over 700 miles or more. Um, but again, if you have something that's like a long haul and is not really time sensitive, that would be a good fit where um, maybe you just have a little bit longer you know, time frame there and you're looking for that cost benefit there. It would be you know, a great fit for that. And then also you want to look at um, just, again, the time frame and seasonality of the shipments that you're moving. So. For instance, we have something called peak season. Um, we're actually kind of in it now between September and then the end of this year. So primarily what that entails or involves are imports coming into California, Oregon, um, Washington, and that can have an immense impact on the amount of rail availability. Capacity can, can cause congestion. So um, even if you're not specifically having something imported in, if you're shipping out of that rail station or in proximity to where you know there's a lot of demand and uh, low capacity, then you would kind of be you would fall in line of um, someone that would would most likely be impacted by that and would want to make you know a different decision whether or not you want to move with intermodal or not. So it's a great fit again if you're looking for something that's going to provide you that cost benefit. You've got um, you know pretty much 
a flexible timeline, I would say. One thing to point out too is that although you know it, it provides that benefit, once it's on the rail, your freight is going to be on the rail from point A to point B. So say something changes in your timeline, it's not something that can be just plucked off the rail and kind of change route. So you definitely want to make sure that um, if you're selecting that mode of transportation, you're comfortable and aware of those, those types of situations that could occur. Yeah, and to your point about flexibility, it's probably important that you have a few days prior to that load meeting to get off that dock too, right? Because it's yeah. going to take some time to plan that shipment, whereas maybe a truckload spot quote, you could get a truck there same day. Instantaneously, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys get it. Um, but yeah, exactly what you're saying. And, and they do follow um, specific schedules too. So, you know, like Kate had mentioned, if if it's a truckload and you need pickup right away, um, they do they do follow certain schedules and guidelines. So if something is not dropped off in that period of time or that schedule, then it would go on the next train or one after due to capacity. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. Appreciate yeah, no it. Problem. Now I want to get some insight on setting a carrier strategy. Ryan, how do you find new providers and what do you factor into that decision? Um, that's a great question, actually. Um, I mean, it, it really, to kind of go back to my point earlier, it, it really takes a lot of knowingness about, you know, what you're kind of getting involved in, um, especially when it comes to bringing on a new carrier. Uh, you know, new carriers typically pop up every once in a while. Um, you know, reputation is a huge thing. But one of the things that I kind of like to do, and I don't know if anybody else kind of does this, but anytime I'm interested in a new service or a new product that I'm interested in purchasing, I call the company and I ask for customer service with anything. Um, and the reason why I do that is because it instantly shows me that if I can get a customer service uh, issue handled prior to even purchasing something, it goes to show me that the company is going to stand behind their product. Um, <clears throat> so to kind of put it in perspective, um, you know, a couple of days ago I purchased a suitcase, right? And it was fairly expensive suitcase. And before I purchased, I called customer service and I asked them, you know, a few questions within, you know, minutes, all of my questions were answered. So I say that to also say that we do that with our carriers. When a new carrier is coming on and we're being, you know, brought to the attention of somebody new, um, I like to call their, their, customer service line and ask them a variety of questions and see how long it takes to get a response. You know, see if this is something that, because ultimately that's what my customer is going to have to go through. If something is wrong or if we have to go through, if there's a, you know, a misshipment or something is, you know, misguided. Um, and you know, it's, it's not something that, that is brought upon often. Um, new carriers that come into our, I think even with what we've been brought on, we've only brought on about, I want to say three or four new carriers, um, in the last six months. But um, it's just doing little like nuances like that often provide value for us in making our decision of what we're going to go with. That's that's great feedback. Uh, how many providers do you typically like get a rate from? If I have a load that needs to be shipped, are you like shopping that out? Or are you going to someone that you know can execute within that like market? Or how how do you manage that? So it really depends um, geographically. Right. So let's say, for instance, like Southeastern Freight Lines dominates the East Coast. Right. Well, they don't really represent anything on the West Coast. And, you know, so it's it really depends geographically on, you know, which areas of the of the country that we're kind of shipping from and to. Um, and, you know, we have warehouses across the country that we pull from. And, um, you know, it. It depends on that, but I mean, we do have a select few that, you know, if, if they're on the list, even if they are a little bit more expensive, we're going to go with them um, just because of the service that they've provided us in the past. And like I said earlier, the knowingness of, you know, well, I don't want to go with this guy because, you know, we got like, you know, a couple freight claims in the books that have been going for six months now. We haven't been seeing any money from them, no responses from them. I mean, you know, so is there's. There's a lot of little key details or, you know, this shipping company, you know, mischarged us on this last shipment or they missed the pickup three times in a row. I mean, there, there's a variety of, of kind of decision factors that have to be made. But for the most part, we have our, you know, our big three that we go with that uh, play a role in, in who we choose to ship with. So you mentioned like passing on providers or potentially not working with them anymore. Going back to the new provider question, it, 
do they typically come to you or how do you find like if you would need a new carrier or do you have a couple that are national that you can always call up should that we have, we have a couple that are national that we can we could typically call up um there have been a few that have been brought to us um you know we've, we've used them a couple times and you know it's 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 really hard too to make a make a decise clean decision right now because there's so much going on in the market right like it's you kind of can't really put too much on the carrier because we understand what's going on. Like we're fully aware of, of the world that we live in right now. Right. So it's, you kind of don't want to be like, Oh, well, these guys suck because they miss this. It's like, yeah, well they also have like 5,000 other shipments that day. So it's like, you kind of got to give them you know, just a, a little bit of, of grace. Um, but you know, for the we most appreciate part, that, Ryan. <laughs> very reasonable of you. <laughs> we try to be understanding as much as possible. I mean, we're all in this together. Right. So, I mean, it, it's, it's just, it's, the world that we live in and we're trying to deal with it as much as possible but um you know one thing that we do kind of stay clear of and i know we were talking about intermodal earlier um we stay clear away from that just because of everything that's going on right now it's you know for most service providers and a lot of companies that are dealing with distribution and warehousing look railroad works perfect it's it was the means of transportation of our country, right? Like there's a reason that it was it was so great in the past. Unfortunately for us and our business and how we like to handle things, um, intermodal is a huge no-no. Um, so we try to stay away from from you know freight lines. We try to stay away from um, you know train train shipments and things of that na that nature. Yeah, and I think that's an important call out. The mode that you choose is unique to customer by customer. Right. So in terms of like your carrier portfolio, is there a sweet spot in terms of like how many carriers you have or how do you, how do you look at that? So we stay with about five. Um, I mean, am I allowed to say who we like to go with? I mean, sure. Why not? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan I of number one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, all, uh, everybody has their own opinion and, and, you know, shipping companies work for each person individually and each company individually. I mean, so what works for us may not work for somebody else. Um, you know, so, but you know, I love working with R and L carriers, great shipping company Estes. Um, whenever it's on the East Coast, I, I try my best to go with Southeastern Freight Lines. They are just an absolutely amazing company to deal with. Um, and, you know, one of the key things that I like to focus on as well when it comes to choosing the list and one of the ter determining factors for me is I'm a, I'm a huge technology guy. And so I like being able to take a pro number and plug it into their website and it just spit out the data that needs to be spit out where a lot of other companies have kind of missed the mark on this. And it's like, you put the pro number in and it's like, it doesn't tell you anything. It's just like in route, right? I mean, it's like we're moving out of that. And so that's huge for our customers as well and our clients because we send them that pro information and so they can track it. And so, um, but for us, I mean, there there's a list of about five carriers that we like to do business with that have, you know, done us very well, um, very responsive, very understanding. And, you know, there's companies even like Old Dominion that I, I love using. It's just, they're a little bit expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so more of like a finite list so that you could probably be a little bit more strategic carrier to carrier, right? Instead of sourcing from 200 plus carriers. Right. Yeah. It's, we've, we've really narrowed it down. Um, and look, I mean, I'm sure there's people out there that are cheaper. I'm sure that there's people out there that are faster maybe in some shipments, but unfortunately and, and fortunately for us, we've found our sweet spot and yeah. uh, we feel that it, it works really well for us. Great. So when do you decide to work with like a 3PL versus going direct to a carrier? Do you prefer one over the other? Yeah, 3PLs are kind of, I mean, they've been popping up over the last year or so, um, especially now that e-commerce has kind of jumped like 10 years ahead in the last like year and a half. I mean, you know, a lot of consumers um, are, you know, trying to find other businesses that are replicating the Amazon method, right? Like they're trying to find companies that are, willing to get product in their hands in the next two to three days. And when it comes to freight, the only way that that is really possible is due to 3PO. Um, trying to ship out of a private distribution hub or trying to ship out of, you know, private manufacturing is damn near impossible getting it out in 24 hours. I mean, it, it takes up to 48 hours to get out the door. Um, whereas 3PLs are great to work with. We're actually in discussion right now with Coyote um, on utilizing 3PL. It's just that with 3PL, it really is, it comes down to, um, you know, 
what are you trying to garner there? Like, what is the goal, right? I mean, you want to make sure that for me personally, if we're going to go through a 3PL service, I want to know that we're shipping this one product in these geographical areas. These are where it needs to be um, because historically, you know, 90% of our business for that product is done in this area. So if we can 3PL this product in that warehouse where, you know, 90% of our consumers are buying it, then that's ideal. Um, you know, taking 50 to 100 products and saying, hey, let's 3PL all of these probably isn't the best idea. Um, you really have to have a keen understanding of what it is that you're trying to garner with, with a 3PL service. And then when it comes to LTL versus truckload, are there different carriers that you leverage for both modes or? Yeah, yeah, there, there are. It's actually, um, it's, it's pretty nice because when you go to a, we've used a truckload service a few times. Um, and it's, it's, we've always had the experience of utilizing those higher end carriers. When we do use the, the truckload shipments, we don't really stick with, um, you know, our typical realm. We like to kind of go up to, you know, the RNLs and the old dominions and things of that nature. Um, because we just feel like they're better suited for that. Um, it's, it's a little bit more up their, their realm of what they do. Um, I mean, it's, you know, TL shipments are typically what these freight companies are used to doing. Um, LTL is really only become something in the last, you know, five to 10 years due to e-commerce businesses. It's, it really didn't exist prior to that. And so, um, a lot of these companies base their foundation off of TL shipments. And so that's what they're, they know, and that's what they understand the most. And so it's kind of helped us build relationships with them so that we can utilize them for LTL shipments, uh, which has been great. Thank you. Uh, let's wrap up our spot quote talk with some of the biggest do's and don'ts. Jess, what are some of your spot quoting best practices and maybe a few mistakes that you could potentially make while spot quoting a load? Yeah, sure. So when looking to spot quote, I would say overall, the biggest thing to just kind of highlight is that information details are key. So the more information you can provide up front, um, the better. I would say a don't would be to not generalize the quote submission or information that you're providing. So for example, if um, you submit a quote and you just put like the origin to destination, pallets, count, and urgent shipment must ship today. <laughs> if I'm receiving that information, um, most likely there's going to be more communication going forward because there's just some, you know, things that are missing that are relevant and could have a significant impact to the success of that shipment that you're looking to move. So again, I would just say the more information that is better, you don't want to really generalize your request. And um, in regards to, say, for instance, an LTL quote, um, I would say you want to make sure that you're providing everything in detail. So don't guesstimate, say, for instance, like the dimensions or the total weight of a shipment. Um, if you can be as precise as possible, that's just going to, again, set up for better success long term where you're not going to see any type of re-rates or reclasses in regards to that shipment. Um, and I would say too, one of the biggest do's is, or yeah, one of the big, biggest asks is just to be comfortable in asking questions. So if you're not familiar with something, if this is your first spot quote or your first time shipping something that you're not familiar with, or say you're a complete expert, but this is just something that's new, for instance, going to a trade show or a specialized location, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, we are here to kind of aid in, in and guide you through that process and suggest, you know, the best mode or modes of transportation when, you know, submitting that request. So overall, the highlights are definitely like information is just key, 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 um, and not being afraid to ask questions and, and have that kind of open dialogue. Another thing too, I would just highlight is that even the smallest information as far as like receiving um, location or like the name or phone number or hours, um, any of those finite details you can find out in the very beginning and provide to us can obviously assist and um, make you know your, your, your shipping needs in that quote um, 
more specific to what you're looking for. So there's not that much back and forth communication and we can get what you're looking to move on the road and delivering in a good, you know, timely manner of what you're looking for. So those are the things I would kind of point out. Um, and then again, yeah, we're just here to assist. So if you're not comfortable, if it's, if it's your first time, you're not sure, please ask the questions, please ask us. Yeah, Ryan, that was something that you wanted to make sure that like you're always doing on your end too, right? Like giving the provider all of the information and contact uh, number or email address per shipment so that there's not a bunch of back and forth, right? Yeah, we, we actually kind of noticed that um, at the beginning we were running into that issue with a few carriers. Um, so I would <laughs> I would be like out for dinner and Estes would call me. And I'm like, why is Estes calling me? And they're like, hey, we're trying to deliver it. And I'm like, looking over at my wife and I'm like, did you order something? <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's, it's like going back to the basics, um, you know, like, like Jessica was saying is really making sure that, you know, you can never give too like, you can never give enough information, right? Like mm -hmm. to, especially to a shipping carrier. So when it comes to spot quoting, when it comes to making sure that the shipping company, I mean, the shipping company in the sense is the lifeline, right? Like they have the product, and their responsibility is to get it to the consumer. So anything that you can do to make sure that that job is done easier is going to be beneficial for not only the shipping carrier, but for the consumer as well. So, you know, it's like little things Like when we, when we process an order with the consumer, we're always asking them, you know, we see that you're calling from this number. Do you have an additional phone number on file that we can call you? Um, even if it's a house number, I promise you, we're not going to call it unless it's an absolute emergency, but it's nice to have an additional number. And, you know, when we do our spot quoting and when we choose the carrier and the price and all of these things, we're always providing not only the phone numbers, but also the email addresses associated with that order. So if, you know, a shipping company needs to contact somebody, they have an email address um, because these, these things do happen and things do slip through the cracks sometimes and making sure that the shipping company has all of the appropriate information is is often key uh furthermore than that i mean some do's and and, and don'ts um you know typical do like i stated earlier is just trying to give enough information but also communicating with your client um when you're processing the order when you're having direct communication with the order you know um you know hey is there any limited space i see you know every order that we place we're always plugging the shipping information into Google and into Google Maps and looking at the surrounding areas. Hey, I noticed that there's, this is kind of a commercial property. Do you need a lift gate? Do you need, um, you know, additional people on hand? You, you know, are you requesting an appointment? Like, like what Jessica was saying, you can never go wrong asking questions. You're, you're not going to look like an idiot asking questions. Like if you don't ask questions, you don't get answers, right? I mean, it's very, that's, it's that simple. And so I, um, you know, we're just constantly trying to do everything that we can to not only make our jobs and our lives easier, but also the, the you know, the um, jobs of our shipping companies, as well as making our consumers have a stress free buying experience. Yeah, that's great feedback. And the goal would be if you if you do that information up front, then we can leave you out of the process once that yeah. load is turned yeah. over, right? And yeah. we can yeah. quit the facilities to execute on it without right. calling you a dinner with your wife. That would be <laughs> ideal. <laughs> it's okay though. We'll answer the call. But it's definitely it's it's just, you know, one of those things that you you like to avoid. And you know, once things like that happen, you you go back and you say, Hey, why is this? Why are they calling me? Is there a reason? You know, and so asking questions once again is going to provide results. Um, and you know, just things of that nature. Yeah, one other call out that I would just piggyback off of would be like as a customer, making sure that you're locking in the rate uh right away. So mm -hmm. indecision is going to be crippling when it comes to spot freight. Uh, if I request a spot load that needs to ship tomorrow and I don't lock it in a day in advance and then I go back to that carrier day of, it's probably going to be a different rate because that carrier probably has selected, especially in this market, a different load at that point. So ensuring that as soon as you know that load needs to be shipped, reaching out to your providers, getting a rate and then locking it in so that you can move forward. Yeah, I was also gonna say too, anything that it's time sensitive um, definitely communicate that up front as well, because that can be a determining factor. And, you know, if you're not sure what mode to ship or, you know, if we need to select a different route for that particular shipment, knowing that information up front is critical if you have a deadline that you're looking to make. I couldn't agree more. 
Okay, so now we have our carriers, we have our quotes. Let's take a deep dive into accessorials. Uh, Elizabeth, can you explain first, what is an accessorial? And then secondly, how do you manage them? Yeah, absolutely. So accessorials are fees that carriers will charge the shipper, um, you know, they come up during the life of a load. You can't predict them ahead of time. So some very common accessorials are detention, which is delayed loading or unloading time. You know, normally um, carriers will give two hours free. Um, so if you're delayed after that, they'll charge for that. Stop off charges, um, lumber fees, layovers, tow news, truck ordered, not used. Um, driver work, if the driver has to assist in reworking or unloading a truck lift gate. So, um, you know, they exist to protect the carrier, the carrier's time, the carrier's services. Um, but there is a way to, you know, as a shipper, put yourself in a position to be a shipper of choice by being fair with accessorials, but also managing them. I think it's really important to, you know, as Ryan was saying, you want to keep costs down, not to just assume that accessorials need to be a part of every shipment. So for example, if you wanted to control detention charges, you could look at which facilities tend to have higher detention charges than others over the course of a quarter, a year, and then look there to see, are they understaffed? Are they double booking appointments? You know, why is it taking so much longer to get these trucks loaded when at facility B, they can get it done in an hour? Um, and then from a shipper of choice perspective, you know, being fair with your accessorials, let's say a standard stop off charge is $50 or $75. You don't want to be the shipper that's only offering $30 for a stop off charge because then carriers are just going to go to another customer and you're limiting your capacity. Um, so that's a high level overview of accessorials. <laughs> How do I know if I'm getting like nickeled and dimed? Yeah, I think it's really important to audit the accessorials and that can be auditing you know what's happening and then also from the carrier perspective so again going back to detention make sure you are looking at in and out times did the driver arrive on time if they arrived late they should not be charging detention even if they were sitting there for 12 hours they have to make their appointment um you know so looking at that making sure you're checking in and out times and then also you know evaluating your carrier network if you have a carrier that's always charging layovers, perhaps look at the transit time on that lane, or maybe the carrier should be making morning pickup appointments, evening drop-off appointments instead of the opposite direction. Yeah, the layover call-out is a great one, just to ensure that your appointments make sense for the transit mm -hmm. and that carriers aren't requiring to hold that load for an extra day, because even if the layover isn't requested, they're gonna bake that into their cost per mile that they're quoting, right? Exactly. And another way to look at that is making sure that your carriers are making appointments within 24 to 48 hours of accepting a load. If they accept a load today that doesn't ship until next week, but then, you know, they can't get a pickup appointment or a delivery appointment until two days after pickup is that on the carrier because they waited too long. So looking at that is really important too to, you know, hold every party accountable. So we all agree that stock quotes are an important part of shipping, but a lot of freight also moves with committed pricing. Let's talk about how smaller businesses can be more strategic when it comes to procurement. Will you kick that off, Elizabeth? Yeah, so even for small and medium-sized businesses, the benefits with contract and primary pricing are just the same as large um, shippers. So you know you get consistent, reliable carrier capacity, um, which helps keep costs low. And really any size shipper can go, go out to bid an RFP um, and get contracted rates. It's not really the size of your network, but it's the state of your network. So to be able to go and get um, prices, you need consistency in your shipping lanes or out of certain origin points, a solid estimation of load volume. Carriers are going to need that. And then a time frame. Are you getting prices for a year for six months um, and when do they go live and when do they expire it needs to be communicated to the carriers when you're asking for these rates what's a mini bid compared to an actual rfp yeah so an actual rfp will normally those rates are good for a year a mini bid and they're for the whole network 
So a mini bid can occur much more frequently, even every month on one lane. Um, and they're more dynamic and responsive to the current market conditions. So they provide carriers competitive rates and again, shippers reliable capacity, but you can almost look at it as project freight too. If you all of a sudden have an influx of shipments out of a certain point, um, you know, and your primary carriers have met their commitments, you might do a mini bid to get extra capacity for this quarter if it's high volume. Um, you know, if you don't have consistency in volume in a lane, doing a mini bid for a short time when you do have that consistency can get you, you know, current market prices. Yeah, and that's a great call out too, because we've seen a lot of customers lately starting to push out their actual large RP to next year and incorporating more mini bids because the hope on the shipper side is that rates are going to decrease. And so they don't want to lock in for a year with the inflated rates that the market is requiring right now, right? Yeah. It's very important to look at where the market is and where the market's heading anytime you're doing any type of pricing event, whether it's an RFP or a mini bid or a spot quote, just so that you're educated, you know, in a market like today, you know, when you're asking for a spot quote, it's going to cost more than it did a year ago. Um, so don't be surprised. And then you can also help manage that message up depending on the size of your organization. Um, you know, CEOs are always going to want costs to be flat year over year at best. That's not realistic, but if you can talk to the market, um, you know, in an educated way, it can help manage that message a little bit. Can you get contracted rates for both truckload and LTL, or is it specific to one or the other? No, so you can get them for both. They're a little bit different. LTL um, has blanket rates, and it depends on LTL, the weight and size of the shipment. For truckload rates, you're getting the rate for the entire truck, whether you ship one box on it or you fill the truck up, um, you have that truck. Whereas with LTL, um, you know, it takes a little bit longer. You're not getting the whole truck. Um, there will be more touches, you know, per, for your shipment, um, but you're only paying for what you use. So for smaller shipments, I would say 15,000 pounds or less generally, um, LTL can be a good way to cut costs there. And then you mentioned project freight. What is project freight? Mm -hmm. So that would be freight either out of a certain origin or to a certain customer. So one of our customers does um, food uh, shows, road shows. Um, so the project freight would be providing them a group of carriers that move around the country with them to move from each show to each show. But, you know, that's not a typical lane. The lane changes, but the volume stays the same. So getting those carriers to commit to that project and providing that rate for more of a specialized um, type of move. Road shows are an interesting uh, project too, right? Because they require some unique add-ons. Yeah. Well, they're very time sensitive. So delivering late, you know, it's not an option, causes a lot of extra work. So over communication on the front end. And then, yeah, you're normally not delivering to a warehouse. It could be a residential area or, you know, where you're sharing with other areas and it's fast turnaround. Um, so yeah, they are a different breed of fun. So in your introduction, you mentioned a little bit about running an RFP, but can you dive a little mm -hmm. deeper? Like, what do I need to know if I want to run my first RFP? Absolutely. So, I mean, Jessica and Ryan have already talked about this, but over communicate and ask a lot of questions is the first thing to set you up for a successful RFP. Um, you'll have a lot of parties involved. You have to set expectations early. Um, and often. But once you have that mindset, I would say before you go to RFP, you want a stable operating environment um, to do all of the exciting things with your network from an RFP. You still need to be doing the basics well, which is having good technology and good operators or human expertise. So if you have a stable environment, then you want to set KPIs for the success of this program. Um, a good rule of thumb is don't start with the KPI, start with the business goal. So is the business goal to hit 100% on-time delivery to every customer? Great, just know that you'll probably be spending a lot more. If the goal is to cut costs and aim to get costs flat year over year, know that and then set your KPIs accordingly. 
um, align the procurement and operations goals, similar to setting KPIs, have an understanding of if you're a low cost commodity provider, then your procurement strategy should reflect that. If you manufacture a premium product, your procurement structure should reflect that. And if you're somewhere in between, which is most of our customers, you want a balance of understanding those trade-offs trade -offs of cost and service and even carrier communication. Like Ryan was saying, customer service is really important to him. If it's not that important to you, you might be able to get lower rates, but never be able to get a response if you're trying to track a shipment. Um, okay, and then understanding the current market. Um, like I was saying, you want to know where we are and where we're going that will help manage any type of leadership, executive leadership, um, and to do it early to set expectations um, and for budgeting. You know, hopefully the market is going to start going deflationary in Q1. So maybe budgets could be flat year over year next year um, or not as up as they were in the environment we're in. But for budget setting, really important to understand the market. Then you want to refine your carrier strategy. So Ryan has it down to his, let's say, five top carriers that he's gotten there over the last 18 months. Understand what type of a supply base you want. So, you know, I think it's always good to have some type of mix of strategic providers, national carriers, smaller regional carriers, and then if necessary, niche providers, but understand who, how you want to make up your network. And then secure the people and technology to actually run the RFP. So you could use your TMS, your ERP, a manual or homegrown process, or you could outsource the bid to someone to run it. And like I started with, over communicate. Your perception of the bid might not be your carrier's perception of the award. So communicate the awards, have a carrier expectation guide, have them sign it and return it. And then I would also set a cadence to review with your carriers monthly, quarterly on their performance. Are they meeting acceptance expectations, service expectations, um, and to build a relationship with them that way. That's great information. You went really in depth. So hopefully that was helpful <laughs> for everyone that's These attending. These are a lot of work, but they're very <laughs> beneficial. <laughs> so with that, we are done talking and we can open it up for a little bit of Q&A. Um, let's see here. So one question that we received, freight markets have been volatile and capacity has been tight. How has that impacted the overall freight rates over the last two to three months? What are you guys seeing in terms of rate per mile or um, I mean, we're seeing a slight increase. I mean, we have been for the last 12 months. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I know we talked about it earlier, especially when it comes to long-term commitments and trying to lock in that price. And, you know, everybody hopes the market goes down. You know, that's just kind of how it is, right? I mean, like, as, you know, as um, as Elizabeth was saying as well, I mean, as a CEO, my my biggest job is to cut costs. But, you know, most CEOs don't really view it that way. They 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 want to cut costs in a, in a, but not also dilute the fact that, they're diminishing service, right? So it's 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 really like a, a two two prong situation. So I mean, it's when it comes to freight and the way that rates have been for the last goodness sakes twelve months. Um, you know, in certain cases they are they are going down. Um, you know, in certain cases they're going up. I mean, with the with the last you know three months and the cost of diesel fuel and you know the the fuel surcharges that we're seeing. I mean, it's, there's increases there as well that take into account for the fuel charges um, and just the shipping rate in general. So um you know we're, we're seeing it across the board as an increase we hope that going into next year it starts to kind of start to kind of normalize again um you know but we'll we'll see what happens and we'll be prepared for it thank you yeah to back off ryan i was going to say rates are still up and we're seeing even more freight go to the spot market because the primary carriers aren't accepting right. their commitments um, so the spot market rates are higher and there's just more going to spot. Um, and the supply of those more trucks on the road is more delayed than we thought there it was going to be because of these production lags. So it's just each, everything's affecting, you know, right. just up. 
Yeah, we're seeing a lot of customers that are uh, reaching out and asking for updated rates so that we can take our committed volume. Uh, also seeing customers ask for updated backup rates so that their freight doesn't necessarily have to like hit that spot market. And then finally, I would say we have some customers that are coming to us and we're working through unique solutions. So maybe it's not re-rating every lane uh, that we can no longer take, but it's more so if we execute to a specific KPI, um, they'll be able to give us a cost plus or something like that. So that holds both parties accountable. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun little world we're all living in. <laughs> Have to get creative, right? <laughs> yeah, you, yes, that is the goal. Yes. Um, this one is specifically for Ryan. What percentage of your freight do you give to like 3PL logistics providers compared to like national providers probably? Um, so currently right now our 3PL service, I mean, I want to say it's like less than 3%. I mean, for the, for the products and the brands that we're utilizing, um, the other, you know, 98 to 97% of, of, uh, freight shipments is all done through spot quoting with, with Coyote and, and due to our own warehousing and logistics across the country. Um, the reason for it is because our warehousing is typically centralized in Louisiana, Texas, California, um, Washington, Oregon, very few locations on the East Coast, like New York, North Carolina, um, you know, things of that nature um, in, in those places geographically. And the reason why we've kind of brought 3PL on for that is because the cost of warehousing product um, privately and independently is a lot more expensive than simply giving the product to a 3PL in, in those states and those locations. Um, you know, yes, there are 3PL charges and fees that are occurring with that obviously um, but when you break it down to a per cost shipment and per cost basis it, it it makes it you know make sense and it makes it more understanding of that so once again knowing the data knowing your industry knowing what's selling knowing geographically where a certain product is going um, you know 3pl makes sense and utilizing that service um, you know i don't believe in utilizing 3pl for everything it just doesn't really make much sense um, things are missed wrong product is shipped you know it's we're dealing with products that are not cheap. We are dealing with products that are stainless, that scratch and dent very easily. And we're dealing with products that come in, you know, two different gas types and, you know, in some cases, eight different colors. And when you kind of put that pressure on a 3PL to make sure that all of those, those refinements are hit, it oftentimes raises the accountability and the, 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 the um, the occurrence that something can go wrong or the wrong product is shipped, which is not going to be good for either one of us when it comes to our relationship with the consumer. So, um, you know, utilizing that and understanding that is definitely key. And here's one more that probably you can speak to, but uh, the question is you're saying spot quote and LTL. Is there a difference between a spot quote and an LTL quote? Or are they the same? Um, so for us, I mean, um, spot quoting is, uh, no, not from my knowledge. No, um, yeah, spot you can quoting, spot quote an yeah. LTL shipment. Right. Yeah. From that's pretty much what we do. Yeah. So we, when we basically go to the carrier, um, or go to coyote and our logistics team is taking over the, the account of where a product is being picked up and shipped from, um, we are doing LTL shipments very, I don't want to say very rarely, but not so often we're doing TL shipments, which are truckload shipments. Um, you know, our, 99.8% of our business is LTL. And when we get those spot quotes, um, we're spot quoting LTL. So to answer the question of that, you can spot quote LTL as well as spot quoting TL. Um, so yep. I hope that answers that individual's question. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about this one? So this is probably more for Birdie. Um, first off, can you do an RFP for LTL freight? And if so, how do you handle like varying weight and freight classes? Does that factor into the RFP at all? So, yes, you can do an RFP for LTL. It's very different than truckload again because of the weights, but it would just be, you know, looking at the carrier providers on what lanes. So you would have to know what you're shipping and what lanes. The class is very important, which is the density of the product. The more dense the product, um, the more expensive that class will be. So that's how you can set um, rings around um, 
you know, the prices and the miles there. But then, yeah, LTL is day of the carrier will let you know the weight of the product. But knowing, like Jessica was saying, knowing your pallet sizes and dimensions beforehand is very important. Providing that accurate information on the front end will set the carrier up for success and will help avoid any unpredictable accessorials. Great. And I think this will probably be our last question. Um, as a customer of Coyote, what are a few aspects of our service that you find put us above other lesser expensive brokers? So I think he's asking, like, why would you choose us instead of a lower cost provider? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, you know, price is obviously a huge component when it comes to doing LTL and, and TL shipments. Um, you know, bringing on a broker to manage all that stuff, there, there is a cost associated with that. Um, you know, there, there are, um, you know, freight being probably our second or third expense is, from a corporate standpoint is something that we take very, very seriously. Um, and so, you know, the services that are, um, you know, the services that are being provided by Coyote are what brought us to Coyote in the first place. Um, one of the biggest things, and I'll just be completely transparent with you, you know, the first year of our business, we started our business in the beginning of 2020, in January of 2020 is when we got our first order. Um, people say starting a business is fun. Starting a business in 2020 is was awesome. I'll say that was amazing. <laughs> a lot of character development. Let me tell you something right now. Um, so for the first 10 months, it was me. That, that was it. And there was no team. There was no customer service representatives. There was no shipping logistical team, nothing. It was just me. And so I was doing bill of ladings. I was doing pickups. I was doing, you know, doing all of the spot quoting, making sure that everything was handled, um, you know, providing pro numbers and all that stuff. And so when Coyote came to me and basically said, look, we can take all of this stuff off your plate and manage all this stuff in house. I wanted to cry, first of all, um, <laughs> but I was like, okay, well, you know, explain this to me. How do we go about this? What's a great way of, of handling this? So while price is a, an, a, a deciding factor for us, it always comes back to service. That, that, that's the biggest thing for us. And so when Coyote basically came to us and said, look, we want to take the biggest chunk of your day off of your plate so that you can focus on other things. It really put into perspective that I really genuinely love working with people that have a deeper relationship for myself than I do for them. Um, that's what business is all about, right? Helping each other and, and trying to manifest both of what we're trying to do here. And so when Coyote was willing to do that for us, it didn't become about price. It became of, you know, about service. And so you know, taking things like that off of our plate, you know, allowing us to understand different lanes and, and kind of not just sitting there and, and providing us spot quotes and then sending us an invoice at the end of the week. It was really, hey, you know, you should change this. You should do this. You know, let's discuss this. And really, I'm not a shipping genius. Like I'm, a, I'm an idiot when it comes to LTL, right? Like I've had to learn all of these things. Fair not. You're on this for a reason. You're. <laughs> well, I, know, right? I guess that's fair. But I've had to learn as time goes on to get to this point, right? And and to go back to everybody's point at the beginning of this conversation. You know, asking questions is what has put us in this environment. And so, you know, it's it's really that simple. Right. And so working with a provider that is willing to work with you is just the most incredible thing that you can possibly ever do for a business. Yeah, you brought up some good points, like the consultative approach and then also taking some of that overhead away from your day to day so that you can focus on more important tasks. Uh, based on what you should be focusing on. So thanks for the plug. Appreciate well, it. <laughs> no, I ask you guys. Don't, don't even trip. <laughs> um, so we are out of time, but as a reminder, you can access additional resources in the topic deep dive section, and hopefully that'll help everyone price a little bit better. Thank you for attending this session of Coyote Logistics Digital Summit. I hope you learned something that you can apply to the, your role. And remember to also visit coyote.com if you want to sign up for a free instant quote with Coyote Go or talk to a freight specialist. Appreciate everyone tuning in. Thanks, guys.